Last class we started in Romans 5 where we were talking about uh, love uh, being shed abroad in our heart. Um, and I believe that that dovetails into some of the things we want to talk about now. And I think uh, John 11 best introduces this. And um, depending on depending on how far we get. Never mind. Let's see. Lindsay, the name of this is uh, Defining Resurrection. I was waiting for y'all to finish before I, I told you. Defining Resurrection. Okay, up to this point we've talked much about resurrection, but we failed to define it. And let me just explain that this definition is not going to be like what most of you are familiar with. Um, but you are familiar with these passages in John 11 where Lazarus died. And um, let's, let's look at verse 23 and read 23, 24, and 25, and maybe 26. <clears throat> John eleven twenty three. 23, Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Okay, so we know that Lazarus died and, and uh, Martha is upset that her brother is dead and she's upset somewhat with Jesus because if he had been there, there would be no death. Now this is, this is, this is your basic mess that Jesus has to deal with all the time. It is a mess of wrong definitions of what he and the Father and the Holy Spirit intended. And it is, so, so here it is, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died because dying is the enemy and you're supposed to save us from everything that is our enemy. Okay, well, let me just explain that death with Christ is your best friend. The cross is your best friend if you understand what that means. Now, I mean, it is anyway, but if you, if you understand what that means, you can easily nod to that because um, it, it would just be, be you trying to live for God without the cross. <clears throat> um, so you've got this, this whole situation <clears throat> going on, and Martha's, um, you know, all freaked out. And so she says to Jesus that, you know, I know whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. And Jesus says to her, um, thy brother shall rise again. <clears throat> all right. So he's using the word rise again. He's not using the word resurrection. He's using the word rise. He, he will rise again. But she doesn't understand. She has a, a Jewish or, or a general understanding of what resurrection is. And so she responds um, with verse uh, 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she uses he shall rise again, but she uses the resurrection in there. <clears throat> and that's got Jesus' attention, if not his ire. <laughs> that's got Jesus' attention. Um, because his definitions are not definitions, they're him. And he, I'm going to just say this, and, and I, I can't speak for, for him, but I'm going to say it as if I knew what I was talking about. <clears throat> He, he can't stand it when we have doctrinal, religious views of things that don't include him at all and that don't find him as the fulfillment of most of this stuff. Jesus says, I am the resurrection, I am the bread of life, I am the true vine, I am the way, the truth, I am, you know, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. And um, 
and he's thinking they should have got that when Moses met me and, you know, and said, who are you? And he says, I am that I am. You know, and he goes, well, that's a funny name. <laughs> you know, that's all you get out of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's weird. You know, no, that means I'm the fulfillment of everything that you're going to be looking for. But you, instead of finding me as the fulfillment of it, you look at me as the fulfiller for what you want. I am the one who fulfills you. No. He is the one who kills you. And then he becomes the fulfillment of all of these things. <clears throat> all right. So, again, this first sentence. Up to this point, we've talked much about resurrection, but we failed to define it. Do we really believe in resurrection? Okay. Well, you know what? We need to read Jesus' answer now. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection. So do we really believe in the resurrection? Jesus looks at this situation and she goes, he'll be, he'll be in the resurrection. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection. If you're going to talk about resurrection, then you need to understand it from my viewpoint. I am the resurrection. I mean, how heady would that sound to somebody who just believed in a doctrine of resurrection and then somebody comes up and goes, I'm the resurrection and the life. We read that and we go, oh, praise God. You know, we take it in some sort of a spiritual way. But if we had, if we were Martha, if we were some religious person of that day standing there and we, we believed in resurrection, which was going to be an event that was going to happen to me a long time from now, and Jesus comes back with, I am the resurrection and the life. You'd go, dude, you might be a good carpenter. Or, or, or you might be a prophet that can do miracles. But you are not the resurrection and the life. Right? Is there a possibility if you were standing there, you might think that? Okay. <clears throat> Is there a possibility that if somebody was teaching that Jesus is the resurrection and then, you know, <laughs> that we, we might go, dude, you're not, you know, that ain't right. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There it is. There it is. There it is. You're dead in him and you're alive in him. He's the death and he's the resurrection. And if you believe in him, though you were dead, guess, who's, guess what? If he comes up, you're coming up. You were raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So this, so this is a, you know, in Jesus' mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on a lower level of his mind, but in Jesus' mind, everything that's written in Ephesians, everything that's in Galatians, everything that's in Romans, everything, that's already all in, in there. It's not going to come. It's already there. He's, he already, all things are fulfilled in him. He's going to do away with every religious thing. And that's, what, that's the book of Hebrews. Every holy thing, whether it be Moses or the high priest or the tabernacle, the height of holiness, the height of reality, the book of Hebrews is going, on. that's not Jesus, he's the fulfillment. That's not Jesus, he's the fulfillment. That's not Jesus, he's the fulfillment. And it is, well, you know, we get down to the book of Hebrews and we go, wow, yeah, you know. But if you were standing there at that time and you hear Jesus talking from that place and your mind is over here and so is everybody else, you just kind of go, you're the resurrection. If anybody believes in you, though he's dead, yet shall he live. You know, is that just another version of the resurrection? And he would say, no, I am the resurrection. Didn't you hear what I said in the first sentence? And he would never say it like that. But <clears throat> That's why I said I can't speak for God. Because, because I don't think we hear him because he's too sweet for us. So, so I come in to shake up your, your definitions and say that Jesus would say, I already explained to you I'm the resurrection. Quit thinking that now I'm the resurrector 
before it was just God, now it's me, and you've just kind of changed your same doctrine, but, uh, or kept the same doctrine, but changed who does it. No, I am the resurrection and the life. And to believe, to believe him is to believe into him, and that is the actual Greek. It is not just to believe him. It is to believe into him. And you can check that out and you'll find it to be so. Um, one of the few things that I tell that is true. Do we really believe in, the, in resurrection or the resurrection? To believe in it is in a proper manner means that we must first have a proper definition of it. The true definition of resurrection is that of life coming forth, right? Okay, okay, but wait, it's not just people coming up. Not, you see the difference? It's not just people coming up. I mean, you know, I mean, Jesus could just resurrect everybody and go, be resurrected and shoot up into heaven and all these carcasses just land in, on the streets of gold. No life, but resurrected, you know, and you can walk around and go, dude, I didn't realize it was going to be this yucky up here. It, resurrection is life coming forth. <clears throat> coming forth from what? Resurrection is specifically the life that is brought forth out of death. Okay, we already know that. Resurrection is the life that was brought forth out of death, okay? Up to this point, I think we're good, especially here. I think we're, we're all on the same page. Get ready. <clears throat> Coming forth from what? Resurrection is specifically the life that is brought forth out of death. What we call life out of death, what we call What we call life down here's the ground, here's death. What we call life is what came out of death. That's important. What we call life is what came out of death. What we call life out of death, what we call life out of death is also called resurrection. Because it's life coming out of death. We call that resurrection. Everybody with me now? That's a, that's a, it's a newer little, just adding little bits here as we go. But it's, it shouldn't be that hard. Life out of death, that life that comes out of death, that's resurrection. What is resurrection? Life coming out of death. You all agreed with me a while ago when I said <laughs> resurrection. Is life. And, but then when I say, when I draw it and point to it, you go, what? You can't. It can't be. It is. It is. It is life out of death, but it is what we call life out of death is resurrection. Okay, let's explain that more. The resurrection is nothing more than an, than an abundance of life coming forth out of the proper kind of death. Okay, now I, think, I think we all have heard enough here in this Romans class to be able to agree with that, that, there's, that there is not going to be any life, there's not going to be any resurrection unless there's a certain kind of death. Okay. Resurrection only comes out of a certain kind of death. Okay, let me say it a little different way. Only a certain kind of life comes out of a certain kind of death. All right, hold on to that. I'm gonna take a drink. Yes, this is tea, not bourbon. However, lately, anyway, never mind. <laughs> <clears throat> it 
Okay, I'm going to reread that sentence and then go to the next one. The resurrection is nothing more than an abundance of life, and I have the word life all in capitals, is nothing more than an abundance of life coming forth out of the proper kind of death. All right, so before I read the next one, let's consider that if it requires a certain kind of death, which is, let me just ask you and you respond, which is what kind of death? A selfless death, right? Okay. None of us are selfless except Jesus. There's only one selfless death, ultimately, and it's played over and over and over again in us. There's only one selfless death. That means there's only one kind of life that comes out of it, which is Christ. Okay. But even more specific, we're going to get even more specific than that. <clears throat> I'm going to read that sentence again. The resurrection is nothing more than the abundance of life coming forth out of the proper kind of death. This means that God is not seeking to impart just any kind of life. He doesn't just come down here and say, I am come that you might have life. And you say, well, he did say that. But he's talking about his death because he knows that life only comes out of death. And he knows that the people he's walking around with and healing and casting demons out are as dead spiritually as they can be. And they need another life. And that's not going to come by him imparting life. Because number one, he doesn't operate that way. And number two, the principle is life comes out of death. As seen on the chalkboard. Amen? Are, are we all on the same page so far? I've been waiting a long time to get to this section. <laughs> all right. This means that God is not seeking to impart just any old kind of life. Okay. So, so the key here is to discover the true death from which we will discover the true life. Any life that Jesus of Nazareth could have imparted to mankind would have counted as nothing to God. Any life that Jesus of Nazareth could have imparted to mankind would have counted as nothing to God. Okay, so you say, Randy, why do you have to make, make such controversial statements? You know, you could say all of this without it you know, just slapping us in the face or something like that. Why, why do you have to say it like that? I have to say it like that because I have to, I have to see it like that. I have to hear it like that. I have, to, I have to look at Jesus of Nazareth and say, you can't do what only the crucified can do. And I have to admit that and I have to say, I know that you're the same one, but it's not the same because you're not on the cross and a beard and robe and sandals don't hack it with me. And I love you, but I love the crucified more because this is the one that fulfilled everything that God wanted. And you can't do it. And if you did get somehow walk around and just bling and life, 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 God wouldn't. What, what was the wording here? It would have counted as nothing to God. Why? Because God believes in life out of death. Because God sent his son to die. Because if he did that, he would be in violation of the very nature of God and the plan of God and the heart of God. And God would have said, I hate your sacrifices. They're a stench in my nostrils. Right? Okay. Well, is that not, in a sense, what some of the priests did was offer up? wrong sacrifices. Do you know that it was possible to offer in faith? Do you know that? Well, you know, I mean, just check out the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is about all these Old Testament people. By faith, so-and-so, so-and-so. By faith, so-and-so, so-and-so. And look at most of the stories. I, I really need to specifically find that class that I did where I went through Hebrews 11 and showed because it's not really clear immediately unless the, the Holy Spirit begin. I mean, a bunch of it is, but all of it is when you begin to see it in light of life out of death. And you go, nope, 
No wonder it's by faith because every one of these situations is, you know. It is only that life which was by Christ crucified that avails. Do you agree with that? Okay. All right. So we would say, we would say, we wouldn't go as far as I do maybe. We would say only life that comes by Christ crucified avails. Therefore, any life that Randy or you or any minister or anybody else would do doesn't avail. Only life which comes out of Christ crucified. But are we willing and ready to give up Jesus of Nazareth so that we follow Christ crucified, so that we follow the Lamb? Are we willing to get out of the church on the earth, have a window, a door open in heaven, go up there, see what's going on up there, and they're all worshiping a lamb, and then keep walking in this and progressing until you see these are following the lamb. They're not just worshiping and saying the lamb's it. We're still down here on the earth saying, Jesus of Nazareth, heal me. And then getting on the way to the end. And I was thinking about it today. The scriptures say the two shall become one. Oh, oh, the Holy Spirit, when he breathes, it's like, you know, it's almost like he's sitting there holding his breath, waiting for us to get in the right place. And he just goes, oh, I think your heart's about ready. He goes, and he just goes over on God. The two shall become one. There were two separate ones. They were separate. They were two separate ones. And they become one, but they're still two, aren't they? Like a husband and wife. Aren't they still two? But they're not. They're one what? One nature. One spirit. One being. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So you realize that, that oneness isn't the blending of two people till there's only one in that sense. It is two becoming one in his nature, and therefore, and therefore what? I mean, folks, if it was, I'm sorry, I, I know my mind's weird, but if it was just us becoming one with Jesus, then wouldn't he really just love himself? <laughs> oh, I love my body. I've seen people like this. You know, I love my, you know. Mm -hmm. All that junk, you know. But it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, isn't it? Isn't it? But it's his nature, and it's him infiltrating our being and making us one. And the two had become one, but they're still two. But the two became one. But they're one. So that, so much so that the, so that the angel can go, uh, hey, John, have you seen, have you seen the bride? There she is. And he goes down and he goes, I don't see her. I just see a lamb on a throne. Yes. Oh, but wait a minute. He saw the new Jerusalem, didn't yes. he? Which he said, this is the bride. And she's got transparent glass and you can see him in her. But you see, she's there. And it's two different things. But it's one spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. It's one nature. It really is the two have become one, but the two become one. Not the two metamorphose into one another until there's only one being. The two are one. One spirit. One spirit. Anyway. And if that sounds weird and you don't get it, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit said all that to me. You know, just you go talk to him because he's a mess. I'm telling you. I don't, go, I don't know where he gets this stuff either. I'm just telling you what he's, this dribble that he says to me. That's three, right? <laughs> All right, but let us get more specific. <laughs> we hadn't got specific enough. 
I had fun on this part. I, it was the Lord doing it to me. But let us get more specific. When many Christians talk about resurrection, they are thinking of it in terms of us coming back from something tragic. When they think of So is the name Jared and Daryl, two R's in the middle. Anyway, um, resurrection. When many Christians talk about resurrection, they're thinking of it in terms of us coming back from something tragic. A, a death, but I came back from it. And it's tragic. This down here, the death, the cross, that's tragic. That's the fulfillment of the whole plan of God. That's where the lamb is more seen. That's where God is more clearly seen and understood in his being, but it's tragic. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you this. If you study out the Gospels, particularly right after the, uh, the resurrection or the death and then the resurrection, and, and even in the book of Acts, and you study it out, and their early view of the cross was this was tragic. People did, bad people did bad stuff. And you don't really, you don't really, <laughs> you don't really hear anybody getting it right till Paul came along. Now, now check it out. You know, I mean, search the scriptures. But I was amazed as I began to see it. Now, Jesus, obviously, in the Gospels and everything, but, but he understood. But there's a lot of talk about what's wrong with this and why they did this to the Prince of Life and all this kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Paul comes along and he goes, the cross, the pinnacle of, of of seeing God as the length and the breadth and the height and the depth and the, and uh, and that's not even going to be more that will be more fully understood as we continue to define the resurrection because you'll see um, you'll see the radical view that Paul began to have compared to the very earliest of people. And then it all began to move into the direction of the eternalness of the cross instead of the tragedy of what people did to someone who didn't deserve it. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> the most common thought is that is that of physical death along with having the hope of resurrection one day. Okay, well, we know that. That's the most common example and definition of resurrection. Uh, in that sense, these believers do believe that life comes out of death, what we're now calling resurrection. They believe that life comes out of death, but more specifically, they believe that resurrection comes out of death. Not life. And they leave Jesus out of it totally. It's now an event, not understanding the death, you're not going to understand the life. There are those who address the truth of resurrection, but only speak of it as if resurrection is deliverance from death. Resurrection for Jesus was not deliverance from death. I mean... Patty, Kim Bebe, Cristo, who lives? You see, it's like, yes, he's alive. He's alive. Jesus is alive. And it's like, what is all this? You know, what's all this? You know, da -da -da -da. he's alive. He's alive. The father's going, he died. He died. He really gave himself holy. He died. And I'm going to exalt that to the, my right hand and I'm going to give unto him a name that is above every name because I'm exalting the slain lamb. 
It's not just raising something out of death. God didn't just raise Jesus out of death. He ascended the throne. He was raised up and exalted and put above everything else. Now you're starting to understand resurrection on a, on a universal scope. That resurrection and the height of it is only based on the degree of whatever the death was, however selfless it was. All right, still not there yet. <clears throat> Consider deeply what I just stated. Their view of resurrection is that it is God's provision to us that we might escape death. That's what resurrection is to many people. It's God's provision that we would escape death. And this is where you get, this is where you get people who are, you know, uh, well, I remember, you know, I've told you before, but when we were in Jamaica and missionaries <clears throat> in Jamaica, we used to sing this song and they would sing it. And it was a Jamaican song and it was just so right down the line of this kind of stuff. Oh, I want to go to heaven and rest. I'm tired of staying down here. I'm tired of my troubles and trials. I want to go to heaven and rest. What? Like, there is, the, there is, you know, there is this thing that death, that life with Jesus, you know, I can give it, I mean, when, when it, Philipp, what is it, Philippians 1, 21, and, and before that and after that, he says, you know, that for me, it would be better to depart and be with the Lord. That's better. He says, but to live is Christ to him, but to die is gain also. Okay, now here, here it is. To live is Christ, that's the death. To die is the resurrection, is gain. It is, isn't it? Am I right or wrong? And he says, I would rather, me, I would rather depart and be with the Lord, but the Lord is in me, and I have to, by his nature, stay here and be with you for your benefit. That's resurrection now, working in him. That's the resurrected Christ that lives in him. We'll explain it more as we go. However, and now, now we're going to get into the explaining. However, God's concept of resurrection is that it is the offspring or fruit of a proper, acceptable kind of death. It's like a, it's like a fruit that pops out of a tree because the seed fell in the ground and died. It's like Rebecca dying on the road and Benjamin coming forth. Also, his concept of resurrection is not bound up in the fact that because we escape death, therefore we get a free trip to heaven, and that is our resurrection. A free trip to heaven, and that's our resurrection. <clears throat> his concept is not bound up in the fact that because we escape death, therefore we get a free trip. That's not his view of resurrection. And if we never get this, we are doomed to always be pulled in a wrong direction concerning circumstances, negative circumstances, death situations. Uh, we will always, always self-protect. We will, we will. We ju it's just, it's gonna be as natural as anything. We will. There has to be a longing. Yes, we've talked a bunch about the death, but we need to end Romans on this note of what resurrection is because it's not the removal of death. It is the resurrection of the Lamb. For him, resurrection refers more to the kind of life that comes out of death. The kind of life that comes out of death. The Lamb life that's raised Yes, Scott? I was just thinking that it's, it's funny because it's really completely the opposite. Because, because the lamb, you know, it's you. 
Right. Right. But we see, Scott said, well, if it's the lamb, he's always given himself. But we kind of think that resurrection is freedom from having to give ourselves anymore to anybody. It's like, oh boy, you know, I mean, I, I lay down my life for my children or my spouse or whatever, but I can't wait to go to heaven and rest. I won't have to, I won't have to give myself anymore. I'll have a mansion and streets of gold and I'm gonna carve my initials in the streets of gold. You know what I mean? And, and on the pearly gates, I'm pulling one of them suckers out and gonna, anyway, yes, Mallory. <laughs> Right, right. Well, Kelly? Right, well, that's right. And, but see, it's like conceptually, we can embrace that for the concept of the bride. But it's a shocker to realize that what God raised was the spirit of the lamb. What God honored and exalted was the spirit of the lamb. And he says everybody and every knee needs to bow to this because this is what I honor above everything else. Okay. When Paul spoke of resurrection, he put it in the context of wanting to be raised to a new life. Raised to new life. Resurrection, life. Raised to new life is I'm dead, but I'm raised into another kind of life. What kind of life? The life that gives itself 2,000 years ago and today. Make sense? This is the life. All right. And I, I was basically quoting from Romans 6, 4 there. Life that comes out of death is called resurrection, but in substance is a new life altogether. The resurrection. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection. It's a new life altogether. Know you not that you've been baptized, uh, that as many as were baptized into his death or baptized into him were baptized into his death but we've been not raised unto new life but we walk in new life because we're one with the raised one or the resurrection who also is the life. There is no you cannot call him the resurrection without calling him the life. You can't. Can you? You can't. To lay down our lives requires faith. Not just resurrection, but in a certain kind of resurrection life. Okay. Now we're talking about faith in resurrection or resurrection life. We say, what is our definition of faith in resurrection? Faith is that when I physically die because I became a Christian, I'm going to be raised, right? <laughs> but I mean, isn't that what everybody thinks? And though, is, I, that's what I thought for years and years and years. But when you, when you begin to read scriptures, you start reading John 11 and you see Jesus and he says, well, he'll rise, but he's not going to be resurrected. Okay, uh, you know, if there was an elevator right here and, and this was, you know, I was say to Jesus, this is going to be resurrected as, uh, you know, uh, he says, you know, and he's standing on the elevator and he says, hand that to me. And he goes, no, I'm going to be the one resurrected and it's going with me. So it will rise, but it's not going to be resurrected. I am the resurrection. And when it gets up there, if you will, because we're always talking about up there, if, when it gets up there, the life it better have is me because we're leaving something down here. Can I get an amen? Yes. Carolyn? Yeah. 
Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right, I have one paragraph left, which will keep us here another two hours. But, <coughs> <coughs> but I, you know, it, it just didn't right for me to finish this without finishing this tonight. Am, are you right? I'm, I'm getting this right? We need to really finish this. Okay. <coughs> the example of Abraham presents to us in Romans 4, uh, presented to us in Romans 4, was related to death with the result that another life came forth from it, Isaac the son. <clears throat> the faith of Abraham was a faith that in their deadness, another life would come forth, right? And it was gonna be the son. It was gonna be the son. <clears throat> and they had faith for that. They didn't mind the death as long as their son's life would come forth and would be brought forth by God. All right. So they had faith in death, in their own death. Not being weak in faith, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. Just read it in Romans. I mean, it's in Romans 4. It's just... It's just real clear about this faith and this, this relationship to death. However, <clears throat> the death that was related in the story of Abraham and Sarah was not that of physical death, which would one day lead to resurrection for themselves into heaven. <clears throat> All right, so now we're, talk we're still talking about resurrection. We're talking about faith for resurrection. We're talking about faith for resurrection. And who is the father of faith? <clears throat> Abraham. All right. So faith for resurrection, as defined by the faith of Abraham, he wasn't believing that when he physically died someday, he was going to be raised up to heaven. That's not even mentioned. There was a greater resurrection that he was looking for and that he was willing to embrace the death that this resurrection would come forth, the son. <clears throat> All right, so it was his resurrection. It was a personal inward deadness that brought them to faith. Wasn't it? It, was, it wasn't a physical death someday. It was a personal inward deadness to any ability, and you could almost call it a recognition of deadness, to any ability to bring forth what pleases God, the Son. They knew that the, the Son was promised. God's going to give us a Son. But he didn't say, I promise you, Abraham and Sarah, I promise you, you're going to have a son. He's going to come in the clouds. And this is going to, none of that either. None of that either. It was, he's coming out of you. That's where the resurrection is going to take place. But to do that, I'm going to, the promise came when they still had strength. How do I know that? Because... Good old Abraham, you know, got busy with Hagar and had Ishmael. And God said, that ain't it. No, no, this is it. I'm with you. You're not with me. You're, you're foreign to me. You're raising up enemies that are going to end up causing trouble to the whole nation because you don't even understand death and resurrection. Well, I, I didn't know. Just, just sit down, shut up. Don't do anything for a while. Just seek, <laughs> just seek me, would you? <laughs> you, know? <clears throat> you know? So it was a personal inward deadness that brought them to faith. It was a deadness of their own capacity to please God. They just... <clears throat> You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, when I came to that part of this thing, because it grows from there, but when I came to that, that part of this thing, <clears throat> um, 
I think we were on Bolivar. And I went, if this is true, Lord, then I don't need to be putting my hands to anything. I need to accept my inability. I need to face it and accept it and quit trying to produce stuff. But I'm a pastor and these people are looking to me. I mean, that's what I, I was going, this is, I can't just, I can't just do this. I can't just not do anything. And shortly after that, we moved over on Maple Street and it really started kicking in about halfway. Those who have been around any length of time really started kicking in. If you just think, there came a time when I quit with the programs and coming up with plans and schemes and the cross started coming harder and harder as far as my teaching. And I, and I, I just, I mean, think about it. I mean, from, think about what I was like at Bolivar or the beginning parts on Maple Street and how I am now. It's not because I got older. It's because, in fact, I've been this way for a while. It's because I just said, I'm not going to put my hand to anything that God doesn't do through me. The seed, and see, I'm not looking up here now. I'm not looking and saying, well, Jesus, you're just going to have to do it. I'm, I'm having the faith of Abraham. I'm saying, I want it to be you, and I'm willing to look like an idiot, which I, I'm sure I still do. <laughs> Um, to be with you, to, to, to allow something to come forth that pleases you. If it's just two things in, in 10 years, just two little things, that's good enough. That's good enough. That's good enough. How much time we got left on that there thing? 13 minutes. Well, that's enough time for Scott to give another comment then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, it's, it's all ordered of God. And I, you know, my, expl let me just say this. My explanation of what I did when I came to this <clears throat> isn't going to work for you. Neither is the explanation of Abraham. Only the seeing of something that is so powerful that you go, you know what? Uh, what was that last sentence? It was, it was a deadness to their own capacities to please God. And I really came to that. And I saw the value of the cross then. Because I said, the cross will stop me if nothing else does. It'll stop me from what? Not sinning. Yes, yes, include that. It'll stop me from trying to please God. And, not, and, give, and, and offering an offering that it doesn't include Christ. And I expect him, and I shove it up into his face, and I say, that I, you know, I've been working for you, and I love you, and you need to accept this. And he goes, it's not Jesus. It's you. It's your good ideas. It's your plans. It's, it's, it's you know, and I'll just tell you this. One of the hardest things is the deadness, the deadness of ambition. Maybe more so for guys. I don't know. The deadness of ambition. I mean, I wasn't joking about writing. I don't even try to write. I don't even want to write anymore. And writing more books, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to write a song. I don't want to do this and that. Now, the Spirit of God comes on me and stuff happens. I mean, I'm writing right now like a madman, and it's not I but Christ. And I am blessed that it's Him because it would be vomit to me if I thought, it was me trying to produce another book that I thought would, you know, everybody really needs and I'm going to change the world. And oh, I'm just, oh my God. Oh. You know? <clears throat> and, um, but it's, it's tough to get to a place where ambition dies. I mean, it gets tough because it's like, you know, again, underneath, the underlying thought is, 
that I have something that can really affect people and they really need, and if I didn't do this, they're never going to get Jesus. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I used to think like that. I used to think like that. And I did, you know, I mean, I wasn't malicious with it or whatever, but I did think like that. And I, I, I'm just, I just, I'm done with that guy. I'm done with that guy. He's on the cross. And, and when, and I was, I was telling somebody recently, anytime a thought, and they don't come very often now, because I slap them down, baby. I slap those thoughts down. The moment it comes, well, you know, uh, this book or this thing that you're doing right now, this is really what people need or whatever. I just go, I don't, I, you know, you know, I forget. I just go, be gone. I, I don't think like that. That is not my mind. I am doing this by the Lord and for the glory of the Lord. And there is not going to be any Randy mixed into it. It's like, again, the old example I've used before. You have this, this glass of ice cold, no ice in it, but ice cold, pure water, you know, and it's so good and everything, and you're going to give it to somebody, and you take this little this toothpick, and you st stick it in human manure, and you just, you know, and you stick it in, just, just t into the glass, and then you offer it to somebody. Are they going to go, you know, oh, thank you, this is so good, and you, no, they would, they would go, you know, it's not pure, and you go, no, no, so much of it is. <laughs> but the problem is that little bit has the ability to taint the whole thing. Am I right? It has the. It, it doesn't just like to touch the little area, and just in that little area, it's like I won't drink on that side of the cup. <laughs> Good luck with that one. You know. No. And and you see that's the way I view it. So I go, I can't allow, I cannot allow for one second any of this stuff. I can't, enter, I used to entertain it. I don't entertain it anymore. It is my enemy because it takes the glory away from Jesus and all glory needs to go to Jesus. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't change you, but I, I'm responsible right here for this. Anyway, we're real close to finishing this paragraph. Um, <clears throat> it was a deadness of their own capacity to please God. It was a faith that out of their deadness, God could bring forth what he wanted, which led to a faith for a promised one to come forth out of their own flesh. Oh, my God, that Jesus could come out of this? Oh, what a promise that Jesus could come out of this? I mean, see, you don't know, you don't know the garbage inside of this vessel, you know? As Paul said, I'm an earthen vessel. I say I'm a garbage can, you know? But by Christ, by the promise, the promise, I want to give you the seed, but you got to want him too. The resurrection as believed on by Abraham was not concerning what would happen to himself in heaven one day, but of another who would come out of them into the earth. Through them, but into the earth. Folks, the faith, first and foremost, is not something that's going to happen either in the last days or when you die. That's that's more like a manifestation of resurrection. If, if, the, if the resurrection himself is functioning in you, then you have hope of rising one day. But if you're putting all your eggs just in a physical manifestation without a spiritual truth, you're, you're, at, you're, you're walking on thin ice. So what does that say to us? It says to us, we need to get after God. We need to pursue. We need to knock. He said, knock, and it shall be open. Ask, it shall be given. We need to start doing more asking. Yes. You know, and, and folks, just I, I'll try to end with this, but it, not just 
not just asking or knocking in relationship to the negative side. Oh, Lord, get rid of this, da 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 I've already said it, and we need to be realigned to it. When we see his face, we are changed, and all of that stuff disappears. It doesn't change by fighting with it. Darkness doesn't flee by fighting it, getting stronger than darkness. It flees when you turn on the light. And, and the change that we seek comes with a pure heart. We, the, that pureness is not perfection or lack of sin or anything else. It's a pure desire. I want it to be, I want Jesus for Jesus' sake, not just the same old thing that I was doing before, always going to Jesus to fix me, change this, make me happy, da 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 da. No, I just want you, Jesus. But I do know, I do know that when I see you, the change is going to come. But I'm not going to be changed. I'm going to be changed into your image, which means you really are. Yeah, it does mean uh, that is the resurrection and the life. <laughs> Praise God. All right, let's pray. Father, we come in Jesus' name and. None of us are worthy to even call your name, much less pray in it. But Jesus, you, you see what we don't see. You see the big picture, and you told us to come boldly to the throne. You told us to pray in your name as if we're already one, which in truth we really are. But Lord, we live so contrary to that because we have not pursued you we have not sought you purely in our heart we have not made you the object of our our love we have not allowed you to be our first love again we have we've allowed other loves in we've allowed so many things that just send us off in another direction so far from you but Lord, you've allowed your spirit to move at this time in our midst. There's a new stirring to go after you. There's a new desire. I want Jesus. It rises by the spirit within us and it is something bigger than us and it is, it wanes and, and rises uh, because of our flesh and, our, and us living in the earth circumstances, but it is here and the spirit of God is here and he is active and so we ask you to use anything, Turner Falls, the conference, use any and everything to, to, to keep us moving toward you, to keep us wanting your life out of us for others to see Jesus instead of, Father, for us to just be seen at a conference doing something that we think will give us some sort of status. Father, I say it for all of us, not I, but Christ. And Father, we are one body, and there is, no, there is no separate dealing during this time. There is no separate dealing at this time. There are no spiritual giants and, and flunkies there are in, in this dealing. There is only that which is your bride, that you have called your bride, and we will give up our either high thought of ourself above anyone else, or we will give up our low thought of ourself, and we will just come, just as the king called Vashti, but this time we're Esther and we're gonna come. And we're gonna come together as one, and we're going to come to you, Jesus. And we're going to look into your face. And it's going to do something to your heart. And we don't even have to worry about that if our hearts are pure towards you. Thank you, Lord. Give us all the faith to, to, to believe your word and your heart. And and to consider your word above our word. Your thoughts are so far above our thoughts. And to just say, 
I can't fathom this, but I say yes to you, Jesus. Just those of you that just feel it, say yes to Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Release us in your spirit, and may we be under your hand as you move us more and more into the awakening of what is already full in your heart, a heart full of this. Awaken us more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.